record on this computer. All right, um, so now we are officially live on Facebook and attendees are gonna start coming in. So we'll give it a few seconds for everyone to come into the program. Thank you all for coming today to our final program of Earth Month, fittingly on Earth Day. Uh, today we're gonna be doing a live lionfish dissection and discussion where you'll get to learn about the lionfish and actually see what one looks like. So just a few housekeeping things before we get started. If at any time throughout the program you have a question, you can use either the chat feature or the Q&A feature to ask that question. We'll be making sure that we're seeing everyone's questions come through and then at the end it all will and then at the at blah blah and then at the end there will be an opportunity for your questions to be answered so if you if you want to wait till the end to ask any you can or if any pop through your head as our speaker is presenting you can feel free to put them there same to anybody watching in on facebook live feel free to comment on the live stream any questions you have and we'll also make sure that those are answered this program is this program is available with closed captions and also an interpreter. So if at any time you need those resources, both of them are available to you for the program. And we'll just give a few more seconds for people to filter in before we get started. Thanks everyone for coming. All right, so I think we're safe to go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna pass it off to Rebecca Harvey, who's gonna give a brief introduction on our speaker and the organization before we get this whole thing started. Thanks, Maddie. Happy Earth Day, everyone. My name is Rebecca Harvey. I'm the Sustainability Coordinator for the City of Boynton Beach. I probably know many of you, but not all of you. So welcome and thanks for joining us. And I hope everyone's having a great Earth Day. It is a beautiful day. So after this, we can all get outside and enjoy the environment. And I just wanted to point you all to our um, Earth Day page on the website, which is at gogreenboynton.com. And you click on the Earth Day section at the top and there's more going on even for the rest of this month. And if you haven't already, I ask you all, Boynton, Boynton Knights, if that's a word, Boynton Beach folks, to sign up for the Mayor's Challenge Pledge. It's on the website. It's um, all you have to do actually is go to mywaterpledge.com and say, take the pledge. And then you're gonna take the pledge. It's just answering a few questions, committing to reduce energy and water in your in your daily life. If you haven't done it already, please do and share it because last I checked, Boynton Beach was uh, 28th in our population category and we're competing with cities all over the country and we definitely wanna beat Delray and I don't know what they're ranked, but tell your friends and let's all do the pledge so we can show how much Boynton Beach cares about the earth. Um, there's more on here too. There's an Earth Day playlist that's a lot of fun. Uh, there's information on the website about our green restaurants and um, the tree wrapping project um, up and down Ocean Ave. They're beautiful trees. And if you take a picture and post it with Go Green Boynton as a hashtag, you can win or enter to win a gift card to our local restaurants. Um, there's more information about our rain barrel program, conservation kits, and much more. So check that out at gogreenboynton.com, and you all know where to find me if you ever want to talk anything sustainability in the city. I will turn it over now to our guest. I'm super excited about this presentation. Um, I actually used to study lionfish a bit in my previous uh, line of work, so I'm interested to hear more. And... Um, and see one up close. So we have today um, Taylor Apter, and Taylor is from the Marine Environmental Education Center at Nova Southeastern University, and she'll be doing the presentation tonight. Thank you all, and here's Taylor. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming today, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. 
Um, so I am Taylor and I am here at the Marine Environmental Education Center located out on Hollywood Beach, Florida. Um, unfortunately, right now we are closed to the public, but we are trying to provide some really interesting resources about environmental science issues, about marine science issues for everyone virtually um, until we are able to open up again. So I'm very excited today to be doing our Lionfish program with you. It's one of my personal favorites. Um, I will start with a brief lecture so we can all learn about the lionfish, where it comes from, how it got here, um, and why it is such a problem. Um, then I'll be following up with our lionfish dissection, which is one of my favorites. It's very interesting to see the nitty gritty, how they get this way. Um, so again, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them into the chat. I'll try to keep an eye on it throughout the presentation, but I might not be able to get to them till the end. I'll make sure to check them before we start our dissection so we can make sure all the questions are answered. I'm gonna go ahead and we'll do a quick, a quick introduction. So, oops, I'm gonna make all of the people small in the corner so I don't get that on my screen. Um, first, we're talking about our non-native and exotic species. So when we talk about our lionfish, they're what we call an invasive species. Um, but there is another subcategory called non-native and exotic. Um, they don't live here. They aren't from here. Um, they are from a different region, a different part of the world. And they're not necessarily having a negative effect on our ecosystem. Um, we have quite a few species here in Florida that are non-native, but not necessarily invasive. Um, our invasive species are animals, plants, organisms, anything that is introduced to a place that's not from there and it causes harm to that ecosystem. It negatively impacts that environment. Either it is eating a bunch of stuff it shouldn't be, there are no predators there for uh, them to have population control. And a lot of these species reproduce very rapidly. Um, compared to non-native species, they become established very quickly in a new location um, and they negatively hurt the population either by creating homes that are not compatible with that area by kicking other things out of their homes, by eating up too many species. And that is what our lionfish are. They are invasive species. Um, we also have quite a few of those here in Florida. Um, we have our Burmese python, which I'm sure people have heard about quite a bit in our Everglades. They're invasive. They are causing active harm to our environment and to our ecosystem. So here we have a few examples of different species we like to go through and sort of discuss which, which ones are native, which ones are non-native, and which ones are invasive. So over here in the top left, we have a beautiful, what I believe is a loggerhead sea turtle. Um, he is definitely native to Florida. Right now it is sea turtle nesting season, which is one of our favorite times of year. Um, that is March 1st to October 31st. And we get a bunch of different species up here on our beaches, including the loggerhead. They're native, they're supposed to be here, and they are doing pretty well comparatively. In the top center right here, we have our Burmese python. Um, so like I said, those are an invasive species. We are seeing those in the Everglades. They're out competing a lot of our major predators. So back in the day, alligators and crocodiles actually used to be the main predator, the apex predator for our uh, Everglades ecosystem but these Burmese pythons are actually out competing them. They've actually been found eating smaller alligators. It's very, very scary the amount of damage they could do um, for such a very cool creature. Um, they mostly ended up here because of the pet trade. That is super common when it comes to our invasive and non-native species. They end up here because people think they make very interesting pets. I think a Burmese python is very cool. I would love to see one in real life. Um, but I don't think I want one for a pet because they do live so many years. They get huge and they're very hard to care for. So usually someone will get it as a pet, decide that they don't want it after a few years and then just release it into the environment. In the top right, we do have another turtle species that is actually our red-eared slider. Uh, we have one of those here at the Meek. His name is Cashew. Uh, he was left on the front steps in a mixed nut box. So we named him Cashew and he is actually non-native. That is why he cannot be released into the wild. Um, Red-eared sliders are very popular in the pet trade and they oftentimes get sold as pets. But again, reptiles are very long living and kind of hard to take care of. 
So most of the time people end up giving them up and not wanting them anymore. And right now we have tons and tons and tons of red eared sliders in our Florida marshes and lakes and rivers. And they aren't doing any harm necessarily. There's not enough of them and they don't have a big enough impact to be doing harm to our ecosystem, but they aren't meant to be here and they could cause harm in the future. And that's why they're non-native. Um, down here at the bottom left and the center, we have two of our beautiful marine mammals, um, our manatee and our bottlenose dolphin. Each of those are native species to Florida. Um, we don't get manatees so much this time of year, but they are our winter species. We'll be seeing a lot of those later in the year or earlier this year. And then on the bottom right is, of course, our lionfish friends. Um, they are gorgeous. Again, they are here mostly because of pet trade, because when you look at them, they are a beautiful, beautiful creature. Lots of people wanted them in their tanks, but again, eventually people don't want them or they get misplaced or they get uh, washed out during hurricanes and they end up in our oceans where they thrive and they become invasive. Um, so that is a problem down the line. So. Uh, lionfish are the first marine fish that's become established in the Atlantic Ocean, and they are by far the worst marine invasion to date. Even in this picture, you see one, two, three, four lionfish um, all over this reef, and they are highly competitive. They outcompete our native species. Um, they're actually native to the Indo Pacific. So if you look at this picture at the bottom right, this aquamarine color over here covering Australia, the coast of Africa, and India. That is where they're naturally from. Um, they're actually found in depths from one foot, which is crazy shallow for a fish, to a thousand feet. So they have extremely varied environments. They could live basically anywhere. Um, they prefer hard bottom environments, but they can survive in mangroves, in seagrass, coral, even in artificial reef. Um, they became popular in the aquarium trade because again, if you look at the one over here on the top left, he is quite beautiful. Um, that striping pattern and all those long fins creating this beautiful mane. Um, and they are very low maintenance comparatively. They're slow moving. Um, they do get big, but they don't require a ton of tank space. Um, there we go. So the invasion. Um, over here, we do have a little infographic, but I'll zoom in on that later. You don't have to pay too much attention. Um, the invasion started in 1985. So that's the first time that they saw one. It probably started way before then. But fun fact is that the first lionfish ever spotted was actually off the coast of Dania Beach Pier, which is right down the beach from here. Um, it is very cool that that is our namesake, but it is sort of unfortunate that it did become a problem. Ooh, we do have a question. I'm perfectly happy answering that one. Uh, what predators control lionfish populations in Asia? Do we have nothing comparable here? Very good question. Um, so the lionfish do come from an area where there are predators, but the main thing controlling their population where they're from is actually a parasite. It's a type of parasite that actually will live in their gills and eventually cause them to die off. Um, a lot of things don't actually have interest in eating the lionfish because they are spiky. They have those big fins that are intimidating. And later we're gonna talk about how they are venomous. So there's not a lot of organisms that like to eat them. Um, there is a helicopter going overhead. I'll try to project um, one of the problems of working outside. There we go. Um, so there's not a lot of predators that specifically like to eat lionfish. But where they're more common and where predators are used to seeing them, including sharks, moray eels, all of those will occasionally eat a lionfish, but their population is mainly controlled by a parasite that will kill them off. Um, we do not have that here, and we are too concerned with releasing that sort of thing in our waters and having it affect our other fish species. Um, very good question. So in 1985, we saw the first one right off the coast here. Um, and two species are actually the main ones that are responsible for the invasion here in the Atlantic. Um, we will show you some pictures of those later, but they are the red lionfish and the devil firefish. Um, you can differentiate, differentiate the species through DNA testing, but they really do look alike. Um, we did not know there were so many different species until we started doing DNA testing because we were so concerned about them and concerned about their uh, invasion in different places of the globe. Um, when they did genetic testing, they were actually able to narrow it down 
to all of the lionfish that we currently have, which are hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds in Florida, in the Gulf of Mexico, even all the way up to Rhode Island, those are all stemming from five to seven, uh, five to seven breeding females. So it only started with a handful of lionfish and now we have this insane invasion. Um, lionfish have been found as far north as New York, all the way through uh, the Gulf of Mexico, down into the Bahamas, into the Caribbean, and now they're spreading down into South America. Um, one of the most prevalent theories after they figured out that there were only five to seven breeding females that started this whole problem is that there was actually a major lionfish tank in the aquariums, in the Keys. And then when Hurricane Andrew came in a little bit before 1985, I don't remember the exact year, but that came in, that did a ton of destruction including wrecking a lot of our aquariums. So when it wrecked those aquariums, it washed those lionfish into the sea, and that's where those five to seven started. Um, that is the current working theory, but they still have no confirmation of that. There we go. So here are some of our lionfish. Um, you could tell that there are quite a few different species. They do have, some of them are very similar. Um, some of them like this one in the bottom right, quite different from the others. But the two that we have here are the two that are circled in that yellow. So the second from the left in that top row right here, and then the second from the right in that bottom row. And if you held those two lionfish up right next to each other in front of me, I would not be able to tell the difference right off the bat, not with my bare eyes. Um, it was absolutely genetic testing that was able to show us the differentiation between those two species. So this is the current lionfish distribution where they're supposed to be. Remember, they're supposed to be over here in the Indo-Pacific. So the blue um, and the green areas are about where they're supposed to be. They actually divided it up so we could see which one is the devil firefish, which is going to be the green, and then which one is the red uh, lionfish, which is going to be the blue. And if you look right here, there's a bright red star. That is actually the Suez Canal, and they are starting to find lionfish in the Mediterranean Sea. They believe that those lionfish are making their way up through the Suez Canal over into the Mediterranean where they absolutely are going to wreak havoc. It is a more enclosed system, so they can definitely do even worse damage there. Over here on the right is where they are spreading to right now, where they're not necessarily supposed to be, where they're invasive. Um, so you can see all the way up to New York, down into South America. And then this little dot way out here is actually Bermuda. So they've been finding quite a few off the shores of Bermuda. Um, so this is my favorite infographic. If you keep an eye on the top left corner right here, you can see the dates are changing. Um, starting in 1985, when we first saw that very first one off of Dania Beach. But as time goes on, all of a sudden they're popping up more and more and more. By the 2000s, they really have started to propagate our East Coast. And then they start to go very quickly, um, all the way down into the Caribbean, into the Gulf of Mexico. And this is not only just because their populations are going uh, way, way exponentially exploding, Ooh, sorry, um, but they are also being uh, more aware of them. They are checking out where they are because they started to realize this is gonna be a concern. We should keep an eye on the lionfish. We should tell people to keep an eye out for them. And there's more getting reported. Um, so the problem with lionfish is that there are no natural predators in the Atlantic. We brought up before how where they're from, there are some predators that are used to them that will go after them as a food source, um, but their main uh, population control will be those uh, parasites that live in their gills. Um, they're active hunters, so they ambush their prey. Uh, they're actually called the lionfish because if you see here over on the left, they spread out those pectoral fins to make sort of a lion's mane, and they use that to herd all of their food up into a corner where they could quickly eat them. Um, one of the reasons that they are such a major problem and a major threat is because they consume 50 to 90 different species of fish and invertebrates, and they will just keep eating. Even when they're full, they're one of the only species besides humans that will continue eating even once they're full. Um, here we have a video. I'm going to try to play it, but please tell me if it comes out a little wonky. Um, it's very interesting to see the lionfish eat. I think we're having issue with the audio, hearing the audio. Um, if I stop sharing and then I reshare, I think we'll be good. Give me one moment. No problem. It might also be in your sound settings. 
There's like an op, there's like a way to optimize for screen sharing. There we go. Predator. We're good. Instilled suction feeder. But the lionfish also has a very rare hunting strategy. Like the wild cat he's named after, he doesn't hunt alone. Working together as a pack, they actively search out their prey. This rocky outcrop looks like a good place to start. Perfect, a nursery shoal seeking shelter in the rocks. The lionfish move in. Their skill is using their far-reaching fins to herd their prey. This nursery shoal is surrounded. With each desperate turn, there's another hunter stalking them. Eventually, there's no hope of a getaway. With the shoal trapped, they all share in the bounty, picking them off one by one. There we go. There we go. It starts to get a bit long, so we're going to move ahead while we have that beautiful image of their mouth popping forward to get that fish. Um, there's a very cool picture over here on the left where you see that its mouth actually can expand. Um, they're what we call a gape limited predator. So they will eat anything that fits in their mouth. Um, they could swallow prey that is two thirds their entire body size. And as you saw in that video, they will come up, the mouth all of a sudden opens and it's bigger than you'd think it is. And then it even expands more as it stretches forward with that membrane to clamp down on whatever its prey is. Um, its stomach can expand to 30 times its regular size. Uh, they've actually found, I believe, up to 60 different species inside a singular lionfish while do a doing a dissection. So fingers crossed that we get something that cool today. Um, usually they're nocturnal, but since they've been here in uh, the Atlantic, we've been finding them hunting during the day. Uh, they have bellies full of fish during the day, and they've been able to figure out the times of when those fish have been consumed. And they've realized that fish, once they move over here, are hunting during the day and during the night, which is even more of a problem because they are eating anything. They're eating big things. They don't stop eating even once they're full. That stomach can expand 30 times the regular size. So even for us, for us humans, our, hu our stomach is about the size of a fist. So imagine if I had 30 fists inside of my stomach creating this big, big, big uh, disc and that's how far out I could stretch that stomach. That's a whole turkey on Thanksgiving day. Um, so they are voracious predators and it is a major problem because of that. Oops, actually here is one of our favorite pictures. This is one of the ones that we dissected here ourselves during a dissection program. And there were 61 fish, I believe. They were in different species, but they were hugely, hugely uh, popular with that particular fish, fish species. Over here, we do have a few shrimp. Um, and up here, we actually had our ovaries that had eggs inside of them. So this was a pregnant female um, that was eating like crazy. And we got to find all these different things inside of her just to show how much fish they could actually eat. Um, besides just eating everything and eating quickly and eating all the different species, they also have uh, reproduction issues. So the fact that they are able to reproduce so quickly and so much is one of the reasons they are a major concern for an invasive species. They produce year round, females are sexually mature after one year, and then they'll live to be to 15 to 20 years old. So that is many, many years of that one female producing year round over and over and over again. Um, they can produce 30,000 eggs every four days. So that is 2.47 million eggs per female per year. So now you can kind of understand how they were able to propagate so quickly and spread so far because they're able to procreate that much and that quickly. Um, the larva can disperse 
really, really long distances because they create an egg sac that'll then just float on the currents. And it could just float around, float around, float around for about 35 days before settling and becoming uh, adult lionfish. So even though those lionfish are really pretty when they're adults, I also like to show the pictures of them when they are newly hatched because they're kind of alien looking, but they are quite beautiful. Um, so over here at the top right, you can see that egg mass I was talking about. If you get an up close view at the bottom right, that is what they look like. All those individual eggs just sort of mush together in this mucus like ball. Um, so they will produce 30 to 50,000 eggs in one mucus ball. Um, and they could do this every two to four days year round. So they will produce that big egg sac, let it go on the current, it'll float away. And that's actually how it propagated so far up the Gulf Stream so quickly because that current would drag all the egg sacs up there. It would settle after 30 to 35 days and then all the lionfish would propagate that area. Um, so lionfish can grow to quite a big length. Um, we have a baby lionfish over here on the right. The smallest collected, it was 24 millimeters. Um, and then over here on the left is the biggest one on record. I believe that was 18 inches. Um, I think it's a little bit bigger. Yeah, 47 centimeters. Um, so that is quite a big boy. And if his stomach can expand 30 times its regular size, it could fill itself up with an exponential amount of fish. Um, so we talked about how they were venomous and that's why a lot of predators are not going to bother them. Um, there is a difference between venomous and poisonous. So we get that question a lot. Is it poisonous or is it venomous? So poisonous is if we eat it, just like food poisoning. So if you eat something and it makes you sick, then it's poisonous. But if something stings you and it injects it into you, then it's venomous. So ingestion is poison, injection is venomous. So they have 18 venomous spines. Um, you can see them all up here, 13 on the dorsal, which is the top, two on the pelvic, which is down here at the bottom, and then three on the anal fins, which is back here. Um, the spines contain grooves and they have a neuromuscular toxin. Um, it really does hurt. Uh, I don't believe anyone has died from a lionfish sting, but I know people who have been stung by them. I thankfully have not in my life and it is extremely painful. And it's the sort of pain that they can't actually treat with uh, pain medications. Morphine won't touch it. Things like uh, dopamine, anything that you get at the hospital won't actually help treat it because it is that neuromuscular toxin. Um, it causes redness, swelling, numbness, dizziness, nausea. Um, and in some cases it does cause paralysis. Um, it is just the worst roller coaster that you have to ride out Eventually it'll work itself through your system and you'll be just fine, but apparently it is extremely painful. So avoid it at all costs. Um, if you do get stung, if you happen to be on the beach or getting a lionfish somewhere and you get stung, you wanna soak that wound in hot water, not boiling, 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 but you wanna bring it to a boil, let it cool off until you could put your hand or your foot or whatever got stung into it and then leave it there for 30 to 90 minutes because that will help break down the toxins before it could spread throughout the rest of your body. Um, here's a close up of one of those venomous spines. Um, so like before on this slide, you see these long spines on the dorsal fin. Um, and those are the clear spines covered with like a, a thin skin. Um, so back here, he pulled the skin back so you could see and it looks just like a needle. Over here by his thumb is that big bump where all of that venom is actually made and created. So once you have a lionfish, if you wanted to eat it or use it for a dissection like we are today, you just have to chop off the spines at the base and then there's no more venom inside of its body. It's not uh, dangerous for you to handle at that point because the venom is actually made in that spine. Um, here is a very cool GIF that we have. Um, this is actually in Pensacola, uh, Pensacola, Florida. And this is just a dive that they happen to go on and there are probably 30, 40, 50 lionfish just hanging out there all in one spot because nothing's really going after them. Um, they do not have any sort of self-preservation instinct because nothing is ever hunting them. So they're just hanging out there and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, I wonder where Jeff went. And they don't even try to swim away. They don't even try to hide. They just go, oh, my friend's gone. Wonder what happened. Oh, my other friend is gone. Wonder what happened. And you could really just pick them off one right after the other because they don't have any sort of fight or flight instinct. They just know 
I'm the top dog here. I've never had to worry about anything before, so why should I start now? Um, so spearfishing is super popular, especially down here in Florida, and it is one of the best ways to combat the invasive species like lionfish, where you could just hunt them. They do make a great meal. Um, they are a very bland white meat. Um, so a lot of people are popularizing eating them, even in restaurants. Um, so what can we do? That is what we just sort of touched upon. Um, so researchers actually believe it'll be impossible to eradicate them completely from the area. They have sort of taken a hold and they are not going to give that up. Um, the most important thing is always going to be education and awareness. So I appreciate you all coming today um, and learning a little bit about the lionfish and why they are so significant and it's important to know about them because knowledge is power. Um, and spreading that knowledge, having it become more popular that people are hunting them and that people are participating in tournaments and just know maybe I shouldn't get that species for my aquarium. You don't want to popularize that pet trade even more because um, the problem is already here. Um, especially here in Florida, we are popularizing what's called a lionfish derby. So they are tournaments held throughout Florida um, where they will create teams of people that are spear fishermen. They will go out there and free dive and you catch as many lionfish as you can in a short period of time. So they will actually uh, give out awards for the most number of lionfish caught, for the highest weight of lionfish caught, the biggest lionfish, the smallest lionfish, um, and people will win awards and participate in that way. And then oftentimes the next day, they will actually host a cook-off tournament with local restaurants that will then use the lionfish caught the previous day to create a special dish that they thought of and it'll be a uh, food competition where everyone can go around and sample little pieces from all the different restaurants. And you can decide which one is the best. You vote for which restaurant made the best lionfish uh, meal. And then they also win a trophy. So it's a fun way to popularize the hunting and eating of lionfish and just to bring awareness to it. Um, there's always also recreational divers. So if you dive or if you know anyone that dives, spearfishes, snorkels, uh, free dives, they are also welcome to go out there and hunt those lionfish. Um, there is no uh, uh, hunting season for them. It is always hunting season for the lionfish. We wanna just be getting them when we see them. Um, so recreational divers are putting a massive dent in those lionfish populations because there has been so much awareness brought to the problem. Um, so we are very lucky for that. And then always, always best thing you do is upcycle them by eating them. So they are starting to have them in restaurants as well as grocery stores. If you start going to your uh, regular grocery store and you check out the fish section, it's very likely that they have at least one option for lionfish because they are trying to see if there even is a market for it. So if we're able to buy it from our grocery stores and prove that there is a market, people will want to eat that lionfish, then there will be commercial fishermen going out there and collecting them for uh, the demand. Oops, I think we have a chat, let's see. Lionfish in Delray just opened. They have multiple lionfish dishes. Perfect, yeah, that is awesome. Um, so it is, I'm assuming a lionfish based restaurant. Um, they have lots of lionfish dishes and that is absolutely something we have been pushing and pushing and pushing for. Um, so I'm very excited to hear about that. Usually restaurants will only ever have like one, maybe two lionfish dishes. Cause again, they're not a very popular meal. So they're just not sure what the demand is gonna be. Oops. Um, in the news, researchers have also developed a net that helped catch lionfish specifically. Um, so it was made by researchers and recreational divers. Um, they've been successful in eliminating lionfish, especially in the Keys, by utilizing this new device. Um, there is some limitation. It won't go below 120 feet, which, as we talked about earlier, lionfish will live anywhere between one foot of water and a thousand feet of water. So we really need to find a solution to get them at all the different levels. Um, but it's very interesting that researchers are finding new ways and new techniques to catch them. Oops, I think we have a few chats. Oops, there we go. Oh, here's the website, perfect. Yeah, everyone click on that website, check it out, see if you are interested in going and getting a lionfish dish. Uh, Whiten Beach CRA is holding a lionfish derby in June. That is awesome. I was so excited. Last year we had signed up for a few and then of course everything had to slow down or shut down um, and we were not able to do that at that point in time. But I know a lot of places are opening back up and they're providing really cool opportunities like the lionfish derby. So please look up that lionfish derby in June if you and your friends are snorkelers, free divers um, and interesting going, it is a great opportunity. 
Um, so that is about it for my presentation. Um, I will stop sharing this at this point. Does anyone have any questions before I move on to the dissection portion? Let's see, I'll bring up the chat. I'll start getting my dissection set up. Um, but I do like to preface the dissection portion with if you are squeamish, if you don't like watching this sort of stuff, totally fine. Please just turn away, close your eyes, turn off the camera, um, but listen because it's always important to get as much uh, information as you can, educate yourself as much as possible. So if you don't wanna watch me going through the lionfish, that's fine, but feel free to still hang out and ask questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead, I think if I share my screen one more time and then I plug in my camera. I have to choose a specific one. Sure. Hmm. I don't know why this is being problematic. Oh, it stopped my video. There we go. Perfect. I'm going to move this back, get my phone out of the way bring our lionfish friend over. There we go. I hope everyone can see clearly. Um, if at any point you want to see something a little bit closer, just throw it in the chat. I have it pulled up um, and I will keep an eye on it throughout the presentation. So this is our beautiful lionfish friend. Um, we do always want to respect the animals that we are using for science. Um, we are learning from them. Uh, we don't want to just be digging around in there. Uh, so we are very thankful that this fish gave his life up for science. Um, we actually got him from a derby. So uh, Reef held a derby down in uh, Biscayne Bay, I believe. Uh, not last year, but the year before. And they had excess lionfish afterwards um, that they did not use for the cook-off. And they offered to donate it to us to use for our dissections. Um, so this is not the freshest lionfish, but we are still very excited to be working with him. So you can see here, even though it's faded, he still has that beautiful striped pattern along the side. Um, I did end up cutting off all of those, ooh, most of those venomous barbs. Um, you could still see some back here, which I'm going to avoid. Um, but he once upon a time had a full head of barbs uh, that were full of venom and I did not want to be touching them while doing the dissection. So we cut those guys off. Um, but if I pull him this way, face first to the camera, you can see he still has these beautiful pectoral fins um, where he uses them as a lion's mane to herd his prey towards his mouth. And then if I open up his mouth, it seems pretty small as is, but if I open it up, you can actually see it gets huge it gets very very large and again he could eat anything that'll fit inside of that mouth um he does have a little tongue a little rough tongue in there um and i think i just ripped my glove on him so that's unfortunate <laughs> um so whenever we start with a dissection we try to use our forceps these are not tweezers tweezers are for eyebrows and forceps are for science we have our beautiful uh little scissors and our uh, knife. Oof. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and we're going to start opening up that cavity at the bottom. The most interesting thing about lionfish is always going to be the stomach for me. So let's open it up, see if we can figure out if it is a little boy or a little girl and figure out what its last meal is. So back here, we actually have uh, the anus. That is the anal gland. And it's very easy for you to just get in there, um, lift the skin away from the organ so that you don't cut those, we don't want to rupture them, and then just cut up towards the face. Now up here, it's getting a little tough. That is because uh, there are gill rakers behind here. If I actually, before I do this, we could look into the gills. Um, you can see that there are beautiful little uh, floaty string-like tendons in there. And those are the actual gills. That is what is collecting the oxygen from the water for the fish. And then behind them is a very hard bony structure. 
what we call the gill lakers that help protect them from anything that might get in there and cause damage to those gills. Um, so it goes all the way down here towards the girdle, and that is what I'm cutting through now. Then I'm going to, let's have them face this way. I'm going to lift up that front fin, that pectoral fin, and cut upwards. Again, trying to pull away from all of the organs so I don't accidentally cut them. Ooh, beautiful. So we have gotten inside our lionfish. All of this up here is actually muscle. So the lionfish do have quite a bit of muscle. This is the part that you would want to be eating once you remove the skin. It's a beautiful white meat, very easily takes flavor, um, but we are not going to be filleting this guy today. We are going to be checking out what's inside of him. So first I'm gonna start scooping away all of this brown goo. Does anyone have a guess what that brown goo all over his organs might be? I will give you a hint, it is because of the amount he eats, it is because he does eat quite a lot. Uh, not many fish accumulate this. It is just the lionfish. Poop, we have poop, that is not it. We are not going into that organs. It is actually going to be fat. Um, there's quite a bit of fat on his organs. Um, lionfish are the only fish that get fatty liver disease. They are actually the only um, other organism besides humans that get fatty liver disease. So we're just going to remove all that fat so it's out of our way. And then we're going to pull back and see if we can figure out if this is a little boy or a girl. So I'm going to move some of his organs out of the way. And if you see up here, there is a beautiful shiny silver bit. Um, that is actually his swim bladder. So fish have this thing called a swim bladder that will inflate and deflate to help them with their buoyancy, to make it so if they want to float, if they need to be more buoyant in the water column, it'll inflate and help them float. If they need to be uh, less buoyant, more dense, it'll deflate and it'll help them sink a bit. So up here is that silver swim ladder, and that is where their gonads hang out. So I'm going to move this out of the way. Oop, I think that's his stomach. Oh, beautiful. So. I'm going to try and get this up without removing it. So on top of my glove right now is a thin like filament. Um, that is actually a testy. So this is a little boy. Um, the ovaries are always much bigger, much thicker, um, even if they don't actively have eggs. But if you remember, those uh, lionfish will be breeding every two to four days. So you will usually find eggs in it. Um, so this is a little boy with his testes. Um, this right here is going to be his liver. That is what I pulled all the fat off of. So I'm going to remove that just so we can more easily get to the stomach. But you can see here, that is a beautiful little liver he has. Um, and all of the junk over here was fat that was just layered all over it. Get some of that fat out of the way. Oof. Yeah, this was a big boy. He had plenty of food. Okay, so this little pouch right here that I'm holding is actually his stomach. I was hoping since he was so big, he might have a little bit of his last meal inside of him, but I think that that is about it. Um, so we are going to remove that and see what we find. Pull that back. Um, so it is attached by a, trying to see on the camera, by a long tube going up towards his mouth. Does anyone know what that is? We have one of those, it attaches our mouth to our stomach, and that is how the food gets there. Let's see, I see an interesting, I don't know if anyone wanted to give it a guess, but I will remove his stomach and give you the answer. Ooh, whatever his last food is, it was quite liquefied. Throat, very good. So yeah, he is uh, connected by his throat, um, by his esophagus down into his stomach. So this here is his stomach. You can still see there's fat all over it. So this guy definitely ate well during his life um, and accumulated quite a bit of fat. Um, and I am actually going to open this up so we can try and see what his last meal was. So again, very carefully pulling away from what's ever in there. Oh, I do feel something hard. Let us see, we're gonna move our friend up a little, open this guy's stomach up, dump it out. Oh, there's quite Quite a few hard things in here. Always very exciting. Ooh, love that. So, right here, 
we have a few teeny tiny shrimp. I think this guy's also a shrimp. We have a few teeny tiny shrimp that were inside of his stomach. Put these guys over to the side. This, I believe, is the remnants of a fish. So it's unfortunate that you guys can't touch it. It does feel quite hard, and that's why I believe it's a fish. And if you look very close up into the filaments, you can see tiny spikes. Ooh, I don't know if that's too close. There we go. You can see tiny spikes coming out. And that makes me think that this is a fish spine. So those are actually the different vertebrae spiking out. Um, so that is the remnants of a fish he ate. And then over here is quite a bit of goo. Oh, wow. Okay, so there is what looks like a spine in his stomach, um, which would be non-surprising because lionfish are cannibalistic. They will eat lionfish that are smaller than they are. So if this is another lionfish spine, it is very likely from a smaller lionfish that this big guy decided was a meal instead of a friend. Um, there is some other hard bits, but I believe those are all remnants of the fish, which now I'm guessing is another lionfish. So we're gonna move those guys out of the way. All of the food can go over here. Um, and we talked about, ow, <laughs> we talked about how it leads up towards his throat, his esophagus. Ooh, he is so much fat farther up. I'm gonna remove all this as well, just so we have a clearer picture of what's going on farther up in his head. Basically, you're gonna remove everything but the swim bladder. Um, and you can see how it's starting to get liquefied in there. That is the fat melting. I am outside on Hollywood Beach, so it is quite hot. Okay, I was hoping we'd be able to see it if I looked up this way, but I'm not spotting it. Usually you can see the heart if you look up towards the gills. Um, sometimes it does actually explode. So I'm gonna look through here real quick. Ah, there it is. I got a little overzealous with my removal. Um, so this red piece here is actually his heart. So when the lionfish is actually frozen and then thawed and then frozen again, um, which has been happening quite a bit as we received them after they had been caught, we froze them and kept them on ice until this moment, um, things like the heart can actually burst and the blood becomes a sort of jelly. So this big chunk right here is what's left of that lionfish's heart. Unfortunately, it is not a hole, but it is still very cool. Um, and then I do want to bring out one of his gills. So like I said, his gills are behind his head. The heart usually sits right in between his gills. So he has these on this side, you flip them over, same on the other side. And then if you look at the bottom up here, right where that pelvic girdle was, that hard piece that I had to cut through um, behind the gill rakers, that's where the heart will sit. So that as water crosses over the gills and absorbs the oxygen, the oxygen will go straight to the heart and the heart can send it right down to the rest of the body. Um, so I'm actually going to pull out one of the gill rakers just so we can see up close what that looks like. Okay, so wipe my hand off a bit so it's not as gross looking. This is our gill with our gill raker. So all of those beautiful red fibrous pieces are going to be the capillaries that are taking the oxygen out of the water. They are the actual gills. Um, so all fish have those gills and they also have this bony structure behind them called gill rakers. And you can see there are actually uh, spikes coming off of that, if I bring it up nice and close, that will protect it. So water will move across the uh, gill surface and these gill rakers will catch any debris. It'll catch any junk that is getting underneath those gills and it won't damage them because the gills are their lungs, essentially, and they cannot have those damaged. It'll do major, major uh, damage to the entire organism if they hurt their gills and cannot get enough oxygen. Um, finally, I do always like to do one thing. I will warn you, it's a little gross. Um, so if you did not enjoy the beginning of this presentation, maybe look away. Um, I always like to remove the lens. So let's see if we could get our beautiful lionfish's leg out here today. Sometimes we can. Oh, it looks like someone already popped this eye, which is not the most helpful. Let's flip him over, see if he has a better one on the other side. Yeah, there we go. 
So I just pop through the membrane of his eye, push forward, and then poof. That little ball right there is actually its lens. So for us humans, um, we will be looking into an air environment, right? And the density of air and water are very different. So for things that live on land, they will have a curved lens, just like we do. They will have a semicircle. If any of you have seen a contact lens, it does really look like a contact lens where it's concave on one side, convex on the other, um, and creates a semicircle. And that's because light refracts, refracts in a way through air that that is the easiest way for us to see. But for marine organisms, they actually have a round lens. So this fish right here is a beautiful little marble. Um, and that is the lens that it uses to see. Um, and that's because of the light refracting in the water is different. So us as humans, when we go into the water, we need to be able to put a pocket of air over our eyes to see. So we put on goggles, we put on a mask, any of those things to put a pocket of air over our face and make it so we can still see clearly. But for those marine ant organisms, they will just have a rounded lens that lets them see very clearly through the water. I'm gonna put that down here. Um, I believe that that is about it for me. I know that we are maybe five minutes early. So if you have any questions, comments, if you want to look at anything a bit closer, please just let me know, put it in the chat, put it in the questions and answers. I'll take off a glove so I can touch my computer. <laughs> and I will keep an eye out. I think questions and answers are different than chat. Let's see. Okay, perfect. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, this lionfish is a big, big guy, but he has been uh, frozen and thawed so many times that I personally won't eat him. But we do appreciate his uh, contribution to science. You can see now that I've been cutting into him. Oh, I don't want to touch it now that my hand's clean, but you can see this pile of scales coming off of him. Um, so the fish do have these uh, scales to help protect them. Um, some of them are usually iridescent to make it so uh, it confuses a predator. For our lionfish, they just have that beautiful striped pattern to not necessarily uh, scare off predators, um, but to just confuse them. So a lot of organisms will either try to blend in using camouflage, or they will be a very scary, confusing color. They will either be bright colors because most things that are bright are poisonous. And a lot of different organisms have learned that and will avoid brightly colored things. Um, and there we go. Oh, no. There we go. Um, so a lot of organisms that are brightly colored are going to be poisonous and nothing will eat them. Or if they just have a weird pattern like those stripes or zigzags, nothing will bother them because it just confuses the predator. Let's see. Oh, thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it. I'm glad that you enjoyed the presentation. Oh, can you open the mouth? So I unplugged that, but I will open the mouth and bring him right forward. You can see in there. Beautiful, beautiful man. That is his tongue. It is very rough. That's how I ripped my glove in the first place. Um, and it's just rough to help grab onto whatever he's putting his mouth on. Um, he does have not necessarily teeth, but a bit of an indentation. Um, coming down from that top lip, that again is to help hook onto any prey. Um, let's see. Thank you very much, guys. Can you open the mouth? Fascinating information. Um, can people get food poisoning from lionfish? So you should not be getting food poisoning from lionfish unless it's prepared incorrectly, just like any other fish. Um, you definitely want to go to a reputable place before you eat it. Um, but uh, once you remove those spines, just like up here, it is not poisonous. Um, I don't believe that if you eat the venom, you'll get sick either, because again, venoms and poisons are extremely different. Poison, if you ingest, you'll get sick. Venom, if you get injected, you'll get sick. And I don't believe that if you drink a little bit of venom, you're going to get poisoned. Um, they are different mechanisms that affect different things. Um, but anyone who is preparing a lionfish, the first thing they should always be doing is removing those spines. Thank you. Have you ever tried lionfish? I have. I've had lionfish quite a few times. Um, we had lionfish curry recently, and it was quite good. Um, like I said, it is a very bland flavor, so I would highly suggest cooking it in something potent. So curry was a great choice. Um, I know someone that does uh, like grilled lionfish, sort of like a jerked lionfish. 
Um, that's very good. And I've also had lionfish uh, ceviche, which is delicious. Um, I highly recommend it. And it's one of those fish that you could find year round, you could find almost anywhere and are very easy to catch as we saw in that video of the spear fishermen just going one right after the other, right after the other catching them. Beautiful. And I think that was my last question. If I did miss one, please throw it in the chat. Um, I will be happy to hang out for a bit. Uh, but if you think of a question later, you could always email us at meek, M-E-C, at nova.edu. Um, I'll put that in the chat. Ooh, that's over. Nova.edu. Perfect. Um, or you could follow us on any of our social media. Um, Seek the Meek is our social media for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, and if you message us on any of those, I will be happy to answer. Otherwise, we do post there about all of our programming that we do. Um, we do free programming as frequently as we can. Right now, it is every Saturday at 1 p.m. Um, we try to do webinars about a variety of topics, not just lionfish. Um, so feel free to check us out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Taylor, for this great presentation. I think it's probably one of the favorite ones the library's done so far. It was really cool thank to you. actually like see inside a lionfish. And you obviously are very knowledgeable about it. Thank you so much for explaining it in a way that makes sense to us people who do not understand um, biology like that. So thank you so much. Anatomy, I should say, not biology. But um, yeah, I don't see any other questions. So I think that's it. If anyone is interested in rewatching the program or sharing it uh, with other people, it'll be available on the library's Facebook page and the recording will also be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, we did get one more question from Autumn. Uh, do you know how long you stay in school for that? Um, to become a marine scientist, um, it varies. Uh, so if you wanted to do research, you do have to stay in school quite a bit. But if you just wanted to work uh, close to marine science, there are so many opportunities that what matters a lot more than grades and school is getting hands-on experience. So volunteering, internships, things like that are really what people look for in this field. Because um, you could get on a research team even if you're not in college, even if you're not going to college, if you have a lot of boat experience or if you have experience at a marine mammal rehabilitation place. Um, so if you wanna do research um, and you wanna help find a way to stop the lionfish, they do recommend going to a four-year college, getting your uh, bachelor's of science. Um, a lot of people I know do go further. Um, and if you wanna work at a, a college level, they do require a PhD, but I know so many people in the fields that are scuba instructors, boat technicians, um, that just got really good at a very specific part, um, and they are still part of the marine science field that way. Great, thank you. Um, and unless there's any other questions, Rebecca, did you have any closing remarks you wanted to make? I know you just chatted the water pledge link. And so definitely, if you haven't taken that pledge, go and do it right now. It takes literally two minutes. That's right. Just a reminder for that. And thank you, Taylor. Yeah. That was really interesting and cool to mm -hmm. see. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really yes. enjoyed it. Thank you for hosting us. Um, and I will hopefully see you all when we do open. We'll be sure to post when that happens. Definitely. Thank you so much, Taylor. And we hope everyone has a great day. And once again, happy Earth Day. Thank you so much for coming. All right. Bye.